So what exactly is breathing chemistry? So we know that we breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. And we mainly think of the breathing process as getting air in and out of the body, in and out of the lungs. But that's only just the beginning of the process. We need to absorb the oxygen we breathe in into the bloodstream and then the bloodstream transports it around the body and it needs to deliver up the oxygen to the cells that need it and at the same time collect and remove carbon dioxide which the cells produce as a kind of exhaust fume. But the thing is carbon dioxide isn't just a waste product it actually serves vital functions in the body and in the blood in particular. In fact it's carbon dioxide that is key to optimal breathing chemistry Getting the balance of carbon dioxide right is what breathing regulation is really all about. And by that I mean that your brain's breathing regulation circuitry actually monitors carbon dioxide much more than oxygen as a basis for controlling your breathing. And of course that brain circuit is automatic and non-volitional. We breathe 24 hours a day and the vast majority of that time we're paying no attention to the breathing. And that's the way it should be. So our goal is going to be to allow breathing to work effectively and not to interfere with it. Why is it so important to get this carbon dioxide balance right? Because when it's not right, when it's dysregulated, the oxygen supply to brain cells is compromised. The blood does not deliver up oxygen to brain cells so effectively. And of course this compromises brain function. Dysregulation of breathing chemistry is in fact surprisingly common and easily the most common form that it takes is overbreathing or hyperventilation. Because breathing regulation is such a key part of physiology, overbreathing can cause some significant problems. Of course it's a matter of degree. It's not usually bad enough to cause what you might call medical symptoms, but it often does cause or at least contributes to problems like fatigue, brain fog and mood problems. Most people have heard of hyperventilation in the context of a panic attack, but a panic attack is usually the result of an extreme degree of overbreathing. Much more commonly there's a mild degree of overbreathing that you may not even be aware of. But the trigger is usually some form of stress. What are the symptoms of overbreathing? Well, it's useful to divide the symptoms into acute or short term and then chronic or long term. Acute symptoms result from transient overbreathing or transient worsening of breathing, and they include a feeling of tightness or restriction in the chest, maybe even pain, shortness of breath or laboured breathing, anxiety or even panic, or just emotional volatility. This happens because the outer part of the brain, the cortex, isn't able to keep in check emotional impulses as it normally would, because it doesn't have the energy due to a lack of oxygen. So anxiety can be both cause and consequence of overbreathing. And for the same reason you can struggle to focus. Or feel foggy or even faint, lightheaded and dizzy. Or spaced out or far away as though you're disconnected from the world. You can have nausea, sweating or palpitations. Now, just like chest-based breathing, Overbreathing can start off as a short-term reaction to stress, but it can also become habitual. When that happens, the body has to adapt to overbreathing, and it can adapt, but the adaptation is far from ideal, and it can give rise to much more entrenched symptoms that aren't obviously connected to breathing, such as fatigue and low energy and low motivation, insomnia or disturbed sleep, depression, chronic anxiety and other mood problems, and a tendency to headaches and migraines. Poor executive function, which means poor concentration, poor short-term memory or the capacity to hold things in mind, and the ability to keep your purpose and avoid distractions and procrastination. Chronic overbreathing can be connected to gastrointestinal problems such as bloating, indigestion or IBS. And muscle problems, pains, cramping and spasms and numbness and tingling associated with poor circulation in the hands and feet and a tendency to have cold hands and feet. There are certain signs that aren't necessarily unpleasant or a problem on their own level but which if you notice them a lot can suggest that you're habitually overbreathing. Sighing 
is the most common one, also yawning. Irregular breathing and unconsciously holding the breath so that you find you have to take a bigger breath to catch up. Chest breathing and mouth breathing are signs of overbreathing too. Let's look at how overbreathing can cause such significant problems. Suppose everything's normal and then some stress comes along. Say you're on your way to an important meeting and you get stuck in a traffic jam or the car breaks down or something. The stress triggers increased breathing. Your breath speeds up and maybe each breath is bigger. In consequence, the carbon dioxide that's dissolved in your blood starts to drop because you've started to breathe it out at a faster rate than your body makes more. Blood concentration of carbon dioxide is actually the key thing. Lowering it causes the blood to become more alkaline or less acid. That's because CO2 is the main determinant of blood acidity. And that's actually quite serious because the body needs to keep the blood pH within strict bounds if it's to function effectively. So even when it drifts a little, there are consequences. And I want to focus on two. First, the blood vessels in the brain especially, but elsewhere in the body to some extent, constrict and this reduces the blood flow. Second, the blood holds on more tightly to its oxygen and doesn't release it to the cells that need it. These two effects combine to reduce oxygen delivery to brain cells, in extreme cases by as much as 60%, that's 60%. It's really a problem because it's easy to get stuck in a vicious cycle of worsening breathing where the brain's automatic regulation of breathing is effectively broken. The brain detects the problem as a build-up of CO2 in the brain itself, and it increases the feeling that you need to breathe more. It feels like you're not getting enough oxygen, and that's literally true in terms of the brain, but of course the blood has plenty of oxygen, your lungs are getting plenty in, it's just that the oxygen isn't getting out of the blood and into the brain cells where it's needed. So then you breathe harder, making the problem worse, not better. So this is exactly what happens in a classic panic attack involving hyperventilation. The less oxygen the brain gets, the more the feeling of panic intensifies until something happens to break the chain reaction. Now, if the overbreathing goes on for long enough, and I'm talking maybe as little as just a few hours, then the body starts to adapt, as I mentioned before, to this new lower baseline of carbon dioxide. We don't need to go into the details, but the body makes some adjustments so that the blood pH is returned to the normal range. But the problem is that comes at a cost in the form of the chronic symptoms that we listed earlier, such as fatigue, that you probably wouldn't have guessed have anything to do with breathing. Another consequence is that now the body has much less resilience to further changes, meaning that future stress can tip you into anxiety and even panic much more easily. The capnometer samples the air that you breathe out and it measures the concentration of carbon dioxide. It's not foolproof as a means of assessing overbreathing because it only gives you a snapshot in time. If you dip in and out of overbreathing, it won't necessarily pick that up. But the main point here is that it works as a powerful biofeedback device. That is, it's able to pretty much instantly detect the variations in breathing that are associated with stress levels and the like. This is a screenshot from biofeedback software showing the trace the capnometer generates. You see that you get a sequence of peaks, one for each breath. Clearly the carbon dioxide peaks in the exhalation, in fact at the end of the exhalation, and then it drops to zero when you're breathing in. Now the distance between peaks gives you the breathing rate on a breath by breath basis. But the really significant parameter is the height of the peak. That height is known to correlate with the concentration of CO2 in blood, which remember is the significant thing physiologically. So that means the higher the peaks, the better. The peak value is called end tidal carbon dioxide, and the software detects the peak value for every breath, and it keeps track of this in another graph. Loosely speaking, when the peaks drop below this dotted line that you can just about see here, which is at 35 on this scale of 0 to 50, that can be considered as a degree of overbreathing. So in the example, there's a brief period of overbreathing here, only for a few breaths. It also corresponds to faster breathing, as you see because the peaks are closer together 